Chapter 6. Checksums. In the previous chapter, I mentioned that Git is built on the combination of two concepts. The first was the directed acyclic graph, or DAG. The second are checksums. A checksum is a way to reduce an arbitrary amount of data to a smaller amount of data that can still uniquely identify it. If that sounds overly complicated, don't despair, because you're already familiar with a perfect metaphor, the fingerprint. The data stored in a fingerprint can never possibly contain all the data that makes you you. But that's not its purpose. Instead, your fingerprint behaves as a checksum, which means that we only need to verify the fingerprint to know that it's you. In computer science, these fingerprints or checksums are calculated by a type of cryptographic function that we call a hash function. For this reason, checksums are often referred to as hashes. You may have already heard of some of the more well-known hashing methods, such as MD5 or SHA-1. The latter, SHA-1, is the hashing method Git uses under the hood. Git relies extensively on these checksums, so much so that each commit object, we'll talk about what exactly a commit or commit object is later, for now let's just agree that the nodes in our graph are called commits in Git parlor, so each commit object has its checksum, and this checksum is used as the commit ID it uniquely identifies the commit. Because of this checksum, you can never ever have two commits with the same ID in Git. If you had two commits with the same ID, it means they are identical in every way, and so they are not two commits, but just the same commit. So how does it work exactly? Well, each time we commit data to Git and create a commit object in the process, Git will make a checksum of the commit object, which will end up being a node in our graph. The following data is included in the commit object, which means it is used to calculate the checksum. The commit data itself, the author of the commit, the date of the commit, the log message that goes with the commit, and finally, the checksum of the previous commit. So with the exception, with the exception of the very first commit, which is a bit like the source of our river and the only node in our graph that does not have a direct ancestor, each commit has a reference to the commit it is based on, this reference forms the relationship in our graph. It says, this commit right here follows that commit over there with this ID. Including the ID or checksum of the parent commit provides strong protection against data tampering. If any commit object in our DAG is changed, its checksum and thus its ID will change, and all commits that stem from it will have a parent commit ID that no longer matches. If we were to go in and change that, it will in turn change the ID of that commit, and then the next one would break, and so on, and so forth. In other words, all of these commits are chained together with a cryptographic checksum that makes it impossible to tamper with them. If at this point, a light goes off in your brain and you think, hey, haven't I heard this before somewhere? Then yes, you most likely have heard about this sort of immutable ledger, because this is the exact same technology that underpins the blockchain. At this point, I feel it's worth pointing out, for the crypto bros out there, that Satoshi Nakamoto's original Bitcoin paper was published at the end of October 2008. As we learned in Chapter 2, Linus Torvalds wrote, writ, wrote Git in 2005, more than three years prior to that, which explains why some people think Linus is Satoshi, but he's not. Enough about blockchain. While it's a useful crutch to explain how different commits are linked together in Git, it would be a distraction to talk about it any further, especially since we're finally getting to the good stuff. Let's start using Git in the next chapter.